welcome to the Jed Break Spread podcast. My name is Jonathan Edwards, and I serve as a pastor at the Grace Brethren Chapel located in Northwest Ohio. The goal of this podcast is to teach God's truth and how to apply it accurately to one's life so that our orthopraxy might be as good as our orthodoxy. May you be blessed as you contemplate God's word. Greetings, saints and fellow bond slaves of Jesus Christ. I trust that your time in the Word has been profitable and that you are being transformed into the image of Christ and not conformed to the image of this world. Uh, Today we are going to talk about a topic that I wish I would have gotten to in June because I wanted to talk about this topic on the one-year anniversary of it, but with the with the extent of Pride Month and the the challenges that we face as Christians to defend against Satan's perversion of God's intended design for sex, gender, and marriage, we had to uh, spend some time during the Pride Month talking about the LGBTQ issue and how to stand firm against that. So I didn't actually get to the issue I want to talk about today, which is the life issue, okay? And what's funny, both of these issues, the pride issue and the life issue, are both targeting our children. Have you thought about that? Both of these issues are targeting our children. The the pride issue, the LGBTQ movement, is attempting to place the idea or the thought in the mind of children that they can choose the gender that they want to be, that biology does not determine gender, that your feelings determine gender, and gender becomes subjective rather than objective. And this is against uh, this is totally against God's original design and intention when we read Genesis chapter 2, when we read Genesis chapter 1, uh, as we discussed in the last podcast episode. So the pride movement is going after children after they've been born. But the abortion, the pro-choice movement, they are going after children before they have been born. They are trying to eradicate children from ever seeing the light of day. And they, they couch this in such terms as, it's my right, it's my body, I get to choose, I can do what I want. Um, and there, there is no consideration for the autonomy or the value of the innocent life that is inside the womb of the woman. Okay? And so today we are going to celebrate the one-year decision of the Dobbs case that came before the Supreme Court. Now, obviously, it's about a year and maybe three weeks since that um, decision was given, but today we are going to look at the impact of this decision and what we need to do as Christians to continue fighting for life, okay? And I I don't think it's an understatement at all, and I, I don't think you can overstate it either to say that the biggest victory for life in the last 50 years is this particular court ruling. It is absolutely, tremendously the biggest victory for life in the last 50 years. And for that, you need to give thanks and credit where thanks and credit is due. And that would obviously go to former President Donald Trump, who appointed the judges, that would be Brett Kavanaugh, Neil Gorsuch, and Amy Coney Barrett, who were willing to hear this case and also make a ruling that was consistent with not only the Constitution of the United States, but really the only infallible word and objective source of truth that we have, the Bible. So I praise God for how he moved politically. Okay, so God has a providential will, and in his will he moved in the political sphere to Uh, have Donald Trump become the president, and also for Donald Trump to uh, appoint these particular justices, and then for these justices to have the courage to make this kind of decision at this particular moment in history. So many thanks are due to these people, these individuals that I've named, and many thanks are due to Christians who have been praying uh, for years and years and years for some kind of shift in this area for some kind of victory. And so we should be we should be just on our knees. That should be our first response is to be on our knees and to be thankful to God for how he moved in all the right circumstances. He put all the right people in place 
to allow this decision to occur. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you for that. We thank you for your sovereignty and for your providential care over our country. Now, this particular decision, the Dobbs decision, it has the potential to save an incredible number of human lives. And here's just a, here's some statistics that will help show you kind of the impact that this particular decision can have. Now, I know the Iraq-Afghanistan war uh, initially was a popular war because we were seeking retribution for the events that occurred, the terrorist attack that occurred on September 11th, 2001. So those wars began as a war on terror, but then they expanded and they became one of these quote-unquote forever wars that America was engulfed in. And the, the reality is that all war is terrible. We don't like war. We, war is honorable at times. It is necessary at times, but we don't like war. And this war quickly became unpopular. And one of the things that was used by the media to drive people away from supporting the war was talking about the number of casualties that occurred in this war. And so I went to a, um, a website called the Watson, Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs, and this is an institute that is under the, um, under the authority, I suppose, of Brown University. At least they're affiliated with Brown University. And they had data from 2001 to 2019 on the number of casualties that occurred in the Iraq-Afghanistan wars. So here is the number of casualties. And this is 19 years worth of war. There were over 7,000 soldiers who were killed and over 8,000 military contractors. So that would be civilians who were under contract with the military to do work in the uh, Iraq-Afghanistan conflict. So a total of over 15,000 soldiers and con- you know, contractors and soldiers combined were killed over this 19-year period. Now that's a lot of that's a lot of casualties, okay? And this was a point that was used by the media to talk about why we needed to be done with these wars. Uh, where too many people are dying, too many Americans are dying, okay? Now, the Dobbs decision passed in late June of 2022, and I found an article from the Guardian, which is a British-based uh, newspaper, and this article was written on October 31, 2022. And here's what the article said. Six months after the Dobbs decision, it is estimated that 10,000 lives were saved by this decision. Six months later, 10,000 lives were saved. So if we extrapolate that data to one year, we could easily say, we could conservatively say, that 20,000 lives were saved in one year of the Dobbs decision. Now, that's more lives saved than we lost in the entire 19 years of the Iraq-Afghanistan conflict. And why am I pointing this out to you? I'm pointing this out to you because of the inconsistencies in talking about the value of life. The national media will talk about the value of the soldier's life and why we should not be in a conflict because we're losing so many soldiers, we're losing so many military contractors, We're losing so many civilians. In fact, the civilian casualty numbers are in the hundreds of thousands for that conflict. And and that's partly because the terrorists, ISIS, um, and, and some of the other terror groups, they kill civilians indiscriminately, okay? But here, here's what we are dealing with when it comes to the Dobbs issue. Here's what we're dealing with when it comes to the Dobbs issue. We are dealing with 10,000 lives saved in just a six-month time frame. 10,000. That's incredible. Okay, so if the media was going to be consistent, they would be praising this decision, saying, look, we are saving almost as many lives in a six-month period as we lost in 19 years. But you know why they're not going to be consistent on that? because they value pro-choice. Pro-choice is a religion to them. They do not want to lose one of the major tenets of their religion. Now, 
I said it's a religion. What proof do I have to back that up? Well, let me tell you how seriously they worship this religion. How committed are they to it? The Pew Research Company looked at the CDC data for 2020. All right, this was the most recently available data when Pew Research did this study. In 2020, so this study was published in 2021, but in 2020, there were 620,000 abortions per year happening in the United States. 620,000. So you put this in the context, 10,000 lives saved in six months or 20,000 lives saved over the course of a year, that's really only a drop in the bucket in the total number of abortions that are being committed in the United States. To give you some perspective on how much 620,000 abortions are, I looked up the number of people who died, the number of soldiers who died, not people, the number of soldiers who died in the American Civil War fought from 1960 to 1965. In that time period, there were approximately 620,000 soldiers killed over the five years of that war. 620,000 soldiers. So a five-year war that took the lives of 620,000 people, still one of the greatest tragedies that we've ever gone through and traumatic experiences that we've ever gone through in our country's history, and that is how many babies we are killing every single year. When you put the numbers in that perspective, we have a lot of work left to do on the life issue. We should celebrate this Dobbs decision. We should be thankful that the Supreme Court ruled in favor of overturning Roe versus Wade and basically putting the the um, rights of abortion back into the states. But we have a lot more work to do, and now we have to get busy at the state level. Okay, so in case you're not aware or, or don't quite understand, all that the Dobbs decision did was removed federal abortion law protections. And, and it basically threw the issue back to the states. And now each state gets to determine through its state legislature what they will do concerning the issue of abortion. All right, so in some sense, this is really good because it's easier to change things at a state level. It's easier to make change at a state level than a federal level. But considering that there are some states in the union that are absolutely wanting to have abortion on demand up to nine months, those states are going to have a higher percentage of abortions, whereas other states like Mississippi, Alabama, Ohio, Texas, Oklahoma, Iowa, etc., these states, uh, including Florida, these states are restricting abortions. And so they're going to have less there, but maybe more elsewhere. So we still have a lot of work to do in terms of protecting life. Now, I said to you that this is evidence of a religion, and I absolutely believe that the pro-choice movement worships the killing of babies. You may say, that just sounds unbelievable. Well, did you know that in the Old Testament, one of the laws that God gave to the nation of Israel was that they were not to allow their children to pass through the fire and be offered to the pagan god Molech. That is one of the laws that God gave to Israel. And so the worship of baby slaughter is not new. You need to understand that, Christian. The worship of baby slaughter is not new. Now, maybe abortion is a much more civilized way to slaughter babies than sticking your child into this altar that is on fire with the image of a god um, erected above the altar. But that doesn't make it any less heinous, okay? All it shows you is the depravity of man and the extent of the depravity of man and the willingness of men to cover up their sinfulness and to cover up their depravity. I want you to listen to these verses in the Old Testament that describe, okay, the prohibition against giving your children to the god Molech by making them pass through the fire, okay? Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10. There shall not be found among you anyone 
who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, one who uses divination, or one who practices witchcraft, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer. Now you may say, what does this even mean, pass through the fire? Okay, there's a lot of examples of children being passed through the fire in the book of 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles. But I want to draw your attention all the way down to the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah, all right, listen to what he says. And this is Jeremiah quoting God and God's indictment against the nation of Israel and also Judah. Jeremiah 32, 35. They built the high places of Baal that are in the valley of Ben-Hinnom to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Molech, which I had not commanded them, nor had it entered my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. So in other words, what the Israelites were doing for worship was a pagan ritual of worship. It was not what Yahweh instructed them to do for worship. So anyone today, and this is going to be my new argument, this is, this is now my new discussion point when it comes to the abortion issue. My new discussion point is going to be, so you believe that it's okay to sacrifice your children to a pagan god named Moloch? No, I'm, I don't even believe in God. Well, do you know what? Historically, people who sacrifice their children believe in this God named Molech, and they were pagans. They were considered an abomination. This is an abominable act. They are Molech worshipers. Do you want more clarity? Listen to Ezekiel and his indictment against the nation of Israel. Again, from God. So Ezekiel is speaking directly what God told him to speak. Here's what it says in Ezekiel 16.21. You slaughtered my children and offered them up to idols by causing them to pass through the fire. Is there any confusion about what's actually happening? No, it's the slaughter of children. It's making your children pass through the fire. You are murdering a child with this act of sacrifice. And so, in my opinion, and and this is an opinion that I've come to over the last year as I've really thought about this issue in depth, my opinion is that the pro-choice movement is a pro-Molech movement. It is a movement that views the sacrifice of children as a religious right. And we need to therefore begin discussing it as a religious practice. It is a religious ceremony to perform an abortion. Now, I think that there are people who are performing abortions who don't understand that they are partaking in this pagan ritual. I, I don't believe that everybody who's had an abortion all of a sudden is worshiping Molech. But I do believe that the people who are pushing for abortion access on demand up to the ninth month, up to the very moment that the baby sees the light of day, I think that those people who are pushing for this kind of access, who are pushing for this kind of unfettered access to murder— those people do worship the god Molech. Now, he's probably not called Molech in their mind. He's called something else, but it is a pagan god nonetheless. And, and I think there are many people who, if they understood maybe the history, the context of what they are doing, if they were not hearing that it's my body, my choice, if they were not hearing that message, if they were hearing, you know, abortion is a re religious practice. It is the symbol of worshiping the god Molech, the god who wants you to destroy your children. That might be a persuasive point. It may not be a persuasive point. But I think for me, that's the point that I want to begin arguing, that abortion is a religious observance. It's not a right. It's not a choice. It is a religious observance. It is the sacrifice of a child to a God. And you may be a witting participant, 
or you may be an unwitting participant, but it doesn't change the nature of what's being done. Now, why is this prohibited? Why is this wrong? Well, as we've been, as I've been teaching our church through the book of Genesis, that's been our preaching series over the past few months, and it will continue to be for another few months, it has become abundantly clear, absolutely clear, even more clear than it has ever been in my life, that God created man in his own image. And because man is made in the image of God, he has an intrinsic value and worth that is far above and beyond that of the animal kingdom. Now, this doesn't mean that we treat the animal kingdom with disrespect or disregard or that it's unimportant. All I'm saying is that there are tiers of value and in all of creation, nothing is of higher value than human life. Why? Specifically, because God made mankind in his own image. It is the image of God That is what bestows the value in the life of every single human being. And this is an important point to grasp. In Genesis chapter or in Genesis chapter 9, okay, after the flood, all right, Noah comes out of the ark with his family, and God gives Noah some instructions for how life should be conducted in this reformed and refashioned earth, okay? So the the fundamental nature of the earth had changed. The fundamental operation of the world had changed, and, and God was giving some new instructions to Moses, I'm sorry, not to Moses, to Noah on how to deal with this, okay? So listen to what he says here, all right? Genesis chapter 9, okay, verse 6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. Now, this is a very important verse, and it actually is a verse that was spoken before the law, but was reinforced during the law, and the effects of this verse are still in effect today. And the basic effect is that of capital punishment, all right? This is what we would call the effect of this verse. If you murder someone, if you shed man's blood, then you have forfeited your own blood. Why? What's the motivation for that? Because man is made in the image of God. There doesn't need to be any other motivation. There doesn't need to be any other justification. No other rationale is needed other than Man is made in the image of God, and so if you strike a man down, if you murder somebody, you yourself have forfeited your own life. That's powerful. It's powerful because it's simple. It doesn't require a great legal mind to figure out that there is intrinsic value and worth in human life because human life is made in the image of God. This is simple, all right? You don't need to be incredibly brilliant to understand it. Why is man valuable? Why do we treasure human life? Because every human being is made in the image of God. And let's just enhance this argument for a moment, okay? Not only is every human being made in the image of God, but God is responsible for forming every human being who has ever come into existence, God, in some sense, is responsible for this. So I want to start in Genesis chapter 2. Just listen, follow this, follow this line of thinking here. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a, mil- a living being. So who formed man? God formed man. What did he make him from? the dust of the ground. That's our original father, Adam, was made from the dust of the ground. And Eve, our original mother, was formed from the side of Adam. Now, Adam and Eve, their creation was unique. They are the only two people who were ever made in that way. But God 
designed Adam and Eve to be able to come together in a sexual union and to procreate through uh, the sexual union, all right? And, and this is known as the one flesh relationship, okay? The one flesh relationship spoken of at the end of Genesis chapter 2. The one flesh relationship is unique because it incorporates physical, biological, and spiritual components and mixes them all together and says, this is what it means to be one flesh. You are one in spirit, you're one in physically, and you are one emotionally, all right? Now, from a bio- biological perspective, it's necessary to have the um, female and the male come together for reproduction. All right, so if we're just looking at it from a purely biological perspective, okay, we just need the female and male to come together. But that's not all that happens. You see, God in some way providentially directs the forming of the offspring. Listen to Psalm chapter 139, okay? Psalm 139. And and if you're familiar at all with the pro-life movement, you've certainly heard these verses, okay? Psalm 139, 13. For you, God, formed my inward parts. You wove me into my mother's womb, or in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So there's an aspect of biology that has to take place, the female and male coming together. But there's also an aspect of God's providential work of forming the individual in the womb. And you may be like, well, that was just David, all right? Date, you know, David. But let's talk about another verse that communicates this exact truth, but in a general form. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 24. Isaiah 44, 24. Here is Isaiah quoting the Lord, Yahweh God, your Redeemer. Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, and the one who formed you from the womb. I, the Lord, am the maker of all things, stretching out the heavens by myself and spreading out the earth all alone. What a powerful testimony, okay? And here, this is a general statement to all who are in the uh, nation of Israel. I formed you in the womb. I also made all things that you see, but I formed you in the womb. And so here we see a very powerful testimony from the lips of Isaiah, a direct quote from Yahweh God, that he is involved in the forming of a child in its mother's womb. So yes, there is a biological component, but there is also a divine component, and it is the providence of God that children are formed in the womb. And we know this to be true when we look at the examples of barrenness in the Old Testament. All right, in the Old Testament, we see that Sarah, or uh, Sarai, Abram's wife, was barren for 99 years. But at the right time, God caused her to become pregnant, all right, through the natural means. It, it, it involved Abraham and Sarah coming together in that one flesh union. But at that right time, God opened her womb and caused a child to be formed in that womb, and and his name was Isaac. There were other situations, such as Hannah, Elkanah's wife, in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 2, who was a barren wife. She was barren, and she was bitter and angry and upset because of her barrenness. And yet, at the right time, God opened her womb, and again, through the natural processes but with his divine hand certainly at work, she conceived and gave birth to the child Samuel, who became one of the great judges in the history of Israel. What's the point of all this? The point of all this is that the religion that is known as Christianity, all right, the religion that is known as Christianity understands and recognizes and supports life. Now, I'm not saying Christianity is the only religion that does it. The Jews do it as well. I'm sure there are some Muslims, others. But we, as Christians, because I am a Christian, and I'm speaking, I believe, to a primarily Christian audience, 
we have a unique responsibility to affirm and uphold the protection of life because it is precious in the sight of God, because it is inherently valuable, because God made it valuable, and because God himself is involved in a unique way in the process that results in every child coming into existence. God has something to do. It it may be a mystery, okay? I'm not sure that I can explain it, but God has something to do with the forming of every child. And so we, as Christians, should be absolutely pro-life. We should be unapologetically pro-life. We should make June Life Month and not Pride Month. And I I can't take credit for that idea. I heard it from some others who were discussing this issue in in the month of June. But we need to understand what time it is. We are fighting a battle for innocent life before it comes out of the womb, and that is a battle against the pro-choice movement, the pro-choice religion. All right, I'm, that's what I'm going to call it. It is a the pro-choice religion wants to murder babies before they come out of the womb. And so we are fighting that battle. But we are also fighting the battle against the pride movement, which wants to pervert babies after they've already come out of the womb. So we need to protect babies in the womb, and we need to protect the innocent minds of children after the babies have come out of the womb. We have a lot of work to do as Christians. We need to be seriously engaged in prayer, in proclamation, and as we have opportunity in our local communities to push our locally elected officials or statewide elected officials to make decisions that are consistent with a biblical worldview. My friends, the one-year anniversary of the Dobbs decision is an incredible anniversary to celebrate. I pray that we will continue to see more progress in the protection of life. My friends, thank you so much for your time today. Keep growing in the knowledge of the truth and keep striving for Christ-likeness in all that you do. May God bless you as you study and apply His truth to life.